According to mainstream history, the human story is quite simple. The first humans originated in Africa. Some migrated north and settled in Europe, and others trekked east through the deserts, over the mountains of Asia, across the Bering Strait, and down into the Americas. This is a neat, clean, linear path to teach in schools. But what happens when we find evidence that doesn't fit the mainstream puzzle? With new discoveries in genetic testing, we are finding that the human story is a complex, tangled web. The presentation you are about to witness is from the original Gaia series, Ancient Civilizations. This episode will examine the Paracas people of Peru, the Denisovan giants of Siberia, and the possibility of an advanced ancient civilization on Antarctica. Who were these ancient beings? Why did they vanish? And what can they tell us about our own existence? Sit back and enjoy this fascinating presentation. In 2014, Dr. Neil Ross and a team of scientists from the University of Bristol's Glaciology Center published their discovery of a valley the size of the Grand Canyon in West Antarctica. Despite being covered beneath several kilometers of ice, the depression was so vast that it could be seen from space. Some theorists were quick to conclude that before the Great Ice Age, Antarctica, like the six other continents, was likely to have been home to ancient civilizations. Dr. Ross eloquently summarized that the implications of his research served merely to demonstrate how much we still have to discover about our planet. But could it be possible that there are ruins, perhaps ruins even older than Gobekli Tepe, to be discovered deep beneath the glaciers? One of the consequences of global warming is that the ice on the poles has receded tremendously, uh, including Antarctica. And the, the thickness of the ice as it is reduced allows greater visibility from uh, earth penetrating radar. So we can see what's underneath the ice. One of the surprises is that the satellite images are sending back now what appear to be large scale complex archaeological sites. So they're, they're not small hunting villages and pit houses. These look like advanced technological civilizations that we're seeing underneath the ice. One of the reasons this is a problem for historians is because the ice sheet in, uh, in Antarctica uh, originated most recently. We've had multiple ice sheets, the most recent about 20 thousand years ago. And that opens the door to the question, who was here 20,000 years ago to build complex archaeological structures on the continent of Antarctica? And what role does that play in the history and the mythology uh, that's almost universal of ancient civilizations? It may be what we now see is the six cradles of civilization very soon will expand to at least seven and possibly more. You get reports occasionally of structures being found emerging out of the ice at Antarctica. Just recently, there was one which took my attention to do with what was described as almost like an embanked area, uh, like a hill fault uh, that was found. And that struck my attention as being different to all the other stories. Um, and this raises my hopes that these settlements did actually exist. I think this matter should be looked into more. The only problem is, can we interest archaeologists to spend good money to go to Antarctica to investigate these sites? I think it's possible that as the ice starts to melt in Antarctica, which it is doing more and more, that it will reveal structures. And if this is the case, those structures have probably been buried in the ice for tens of thousands of years. So these are gonna be very, very ancient indeed. 
uh, and they could easily be the product of hybrid descendants. Could it really be true that there was once an unknown civilization of ancient beings in Antarctica? In 1929, a map was discovered inside Istanbul's Tokapi Palace, depicting Antarctica before it was covered with ice. Archaeologists have been able to carbon date the map's creation back to a Turkish admiral and cartographer named Perry Reis, who plotted it in 1513. This age was hundreds of years before the continent was discovered by modern man. Reese's map has both conventional and alternative scholars flummoxed. Where did he gather his knowledge? If the landmass depicted is indeed Antarctica, is it possible that our true origins date back to a prehistoric seafaring civilization? While mainstream scientists are resistant to get behind these findings, no other explanation for the mysteries this map presents have been offered. But with global warming exposing new topography under the glaciers, harder evidence may be just around the corner. We are about to hear from official sources that architecture has been located in Antarctica that will confirm that there was in fact intelligently built ruins down there. And that would be a world changing thing of significance. This Atlantean legend has an incredible amount of provable data behind it. And if we do get the disclosure that we're being promised, this is going to become an open public acknowledged thing that there are in, in fact stone monuments under the ice in Antarctica that are very ancient. If that happens, everything that we thought we knew about human history has to be rewritten and we're now dealing with ancient civilizations far predating those which we now acknowledge to be true. Most academics believe that all Native American people, no matter where you find them, that all of their ancestors came across the Bering Land Bridge and that they all only had four genotypes, A, B, C, and D. Anybody who's a pure-blooded Indian or Native person in the Americas their whole haplogroup or genetics are A, B, C, or D. But we've tested three of these so far, and they are not A, B, C, or D. They show ancestry either from Europe or the Middle East or the Middle East people who moved to Europe. So that completely blows the theory that there was only one way to get to the Americas in pre-Columbian times. It means that people were sailing the oceans thousands of years ago, and they knew where they were going. And they had the capability of navigation to be able to circumnavigate the planet long before the Vikings. We've been taught so little in school about the history of humanity, and academics have a tendency to not talk to indigenous people about their own history. They think they made their stories up about where their ancestors came from. In 2011, geochemist Stacy Lowry found evidence that America and Antarctica were once joined before a billion years of continental drift sent them in different directions. Since then, more geologists have come forward with tests showing that the composition of magnetic isotopes in rocks taken from Antarctica's coastland were indistinguishable from samples of rocks in a rift that runs through the Great Lakes of Michigan. The two rock samples are reportedly the exact same age and have identical chemical properties. If Antarctica was once connected to the Americas, then is it also possible that the same pre-Adamite species once populated both more than 55,000 years ago? Brian Forrester brings us back to the DNA of ancient humans and what it might reveal. The ancestry of these people could be incredibly complicated. Um, initial DNA results indicated that at least part of their bloodline is not Native American whatsoever. Um, so we're, we're looking at the possibility that part of their ancestry is from the Middle East, which means they did not cross the Bering Land Bridge like all other Native Americans uh, ancestors supposedly did. And that would be a major historical discovery I've been studying these, these people for about eight 
to 10 years. It seems that only the nobility of the Paracas culture of the coast of Peru had elongated skulls. And the preservation in that area is almost perfect. So we do have examples of the skulls with hair. And the hair is always red, and it's genetic red. It's not the result of bleaching or, or the sun or something like that. And so red hair originates in the Middle East, in Iraq, Iran, and Afghanistan. So if they had red hair, they likely had light-colored skin, as well, possibly, as green or blue eyes. All three of those characteristics are not typical of Native American people. So that could very well indicate that those ancestors sailed from the Middle East to the coast of Peru. In 1928, in a desert on the Paracas Peninsula on the south coast of Peru, archaeologist Julio Tello unearthed a graveyard filled with the remains of corpses with the largest elongated skulls found anywhere in the world. Some were dated back as far as 3,000 years. This discovery shocked scientific communities because it challenged what had been recorded in Peruvian and human history. Tello's discovery has since become known as the Paracas skulls. And even more astoundingly, since 1928, other elongated skulls have been found. The oldest elongated skulls in the world have been discovered in Iraq, in one specific cave. And the initial DNA testing that we've been able to do indicates that these people had haplogroups which are either from northern Europe or from the Middle East. What exactly they are will require rigorous scientific examination. We were able to do DNA testing of a baby that uh, died at 18 months and had strawberry blonde hair, which is not Native American. And the analysis that was done indicated that it had segments of DNA that do not match anything known to be human. And we also know that all ancestors of Native Americans, all of their ancestors are believed to have crossed the Bering Land Bridge from South or from Eastern Asia. So nobody from the Middle East or from Europe would walk across all of Asia in order to cross into North America. These ancient people had seafaring skills. They knew how to build boats and they knew how to sail thousands of years before the Vikings or Columbus or anyone like that. So it's quite likely that they migrated by sea through the Indian Ocean and then across the Pacific. Skeptics have long dismissed the validity of the remains found with elongated skulls as being scientific proof of pre-Adamites. They claim that these skulls are artificial, an objection made even more complicated by the fact that there have been tribes who practiced cranial deformation on infants. When it comes to the discovery of elongated heads, a lot of the mainstream scientists might shrug it off and say, well, this is an indication of binding. They believe that humans bound their skulls to make themselves look like they had these massive heads, which doesn't quite make sense unless you actually did have some kind of gods who had those heads and you were trying to imitate those heads. The cranial deformation is where a newborn child's um, head is bound, usually with something like leather or possibly wood on the front and back, uh, wrapped it with some kind of textile. So by three years old, the child's skull is completely bone, and then, <clears throat> therefore, throughout their life, they maintain that design. It was done in order to differentiate physically the nobility from the common class. But you can distinguish between cranial deformation and what I'm talking about. You see the obvious flattening of the front and back of the skull with cranial deformation. I've studied this subject about elongated skulls for about eight years. And as I said, they did exist on all six inhabited continents, but almost all of them are the example of cranial deformation, which is changing the shape of the skull. However, in the case of the Paracas, we have the largest elongated skulls ever found on the planet. And that makes the Paracas culture very specifically interesting. We've even found baby skeletons where the skull is elongated. There was one recently I saw of a probably three-month-old and its head was twice the size of normal. 
So it's not just that the shape is different, the volume is different. And many medical experts have looked at these and they've said you can change the shape of a baby's head because it's very soft to begin with, but you can't increase the volume. So that by itself is telling us we're looking at a, a genetic variation. In 2013, Russian photographer Georgi Sidorov discovered a colossal megalith in a remote wilderness area in Siberia. During an expedition in the foothills of Mount Shoria near Altai, Sidorov came upon a great wall of granite blocks. What made his discovery unusual was that these gargantuan stones had flat surfaces, right angles, and sharp corners, reminiscent of Cyclopean masonry. The thing is that nature does not happen to see straight angles. All blocks are built like in a brick wall. All of them have straight angles like a castle. There are thousands of clues that say this formation is built by a form of intelligence. The beauty and precision of this 130-foot structure has left archaeologists with no explanation for how such an arrangement could have formed naturally. Geologists have estimated that the largest blocks of granite at Mount Shoria weigh three to 4,000 tons. Before this, the pregnant woman stone of Baalbek, weighing 1,500 tons, was the largest single stone used in an ancient site. You have these beautiful polygonal walls. They are perfect straight lines with perfect right angles. You have these massive blocks of granite that look like this. Someone's taken a big diamond drill and sawed them right down the middle. On granite, that takes a little effort. The Russian scientists that went there, they discovered some things which cannot be explained by nature, which are these beautiful round, almost um, pot surfaces where they've taken a drill and they've formed the perfect depression. And they also have these perfect tunnels and these doorways that seem to be very deliberately put there. So maybe what we're doing here is taking an entire mountain that's been completely shaped by human hands. The megalithic structure discovered in the Altai Mountains near the Denisovan Cave uh, harkens really to structures like Baalbek and Lebanon, uh, these cyclopean megalithic structures that are hundreds of tons in weight. Stones so large that even our best equipment today can, could not possibly even come close to lifting them. And uh, that they were using a type of science and mathematical understanding that just wasn't available to our ancient ancestors. If Georgi Sidorov's discovery is real, could it be evidence that remote Siberia was once home to an advanced civilization? Near this discovery of the megalithic wall, Scientists believe they have found bones from a new species. Could these places be linked? In 2008, archaeologists made world headlines when they unearthed a Paleolithic finger bone from a juvenile female estimated to be 41,000 years old. Further DNA analysis indicated the finger was from a previously unknown and extinct homonym subspecies these previously unknown ancestors were christened with the name Denisovan. The Denisovans are probably the most exciting discovery in the origins of humanity for decades. I mean, arguably even in the last hundred years, because we're talking about a previously unknown, let's say human population, um, who are different to the Neanderthals, they're different to anatomical modern humans. The Denisovans occupied large areas of central, southern and eastern Asia for anything up to 200,000 years. They've told us, for instance, that many modern day human populations in the eastern part of the Eurasian continent have the DNA which has been inherited from the Denisovans in a similar manner to how 
the people of the Western Eurasian continent have DNA within them of the Neanderthals. They were of extreme size, not just broad, but of extreme height, perhaps even as much as seven feet tall. But the DNA from these fossil remains have told us so much. It has archaeologists coming up in rashes because suddenly we have here another human species that is completely forgotten. But who was this forgotten species? And how could their destiny on the planet be linked with ours? Firstly, we know that a, a, a further tooth that was found um, in the Denisova cave, but they didn't really know too much about it, has now been confirmed to be that of a Denisovan woman. It's about 125,000 years old. And this confirms that the Denisovans were in this area for a much longer period than had initially been suggested. And that's many, many generations. That means that they were an incredibly developed population. You go back before 200,000 years, and, and in many areas at that time, our species was coexisting with other human species who, who were human enough for us to interbreed with them. For example, the Neanderthals. For example, the recently discovered Denisovans. Both of these human species who are not anatomically modern humans have left traces in our anatomically modern human DNA. We have to ask, if, if we're talking of records going back hundreds of thousands of years, is it possible that these other human species uh, reached a high level of development uh, during their tenure of life on Earth? Is it, is it possible that they were uh, advanced in, in, in some way? Artifacts found in recent archaeological digs at the cave suggest that the Denisovans were not only large, but highly intelligent. Some scientists, like Jack Carey, believe they had the ability to create sophisticated technology. The Denisovans had to be much more advanced than what they're being uh, credited with. Um, I say that because of the discovery of a piece of jewelry that they found in the uh, original Denisovan cave that dated 40,000 years ago. It was made of a green polished rock and anthropologists believe that this jewelry was only worn on very special occasions. That indicates a culture. It indicates art. It indicates a higher understanding of reality. These aren't people that were simply clubbing animals to death and using their furs. These were people that were literally constructing jewelry. That's something um, a lot of anthropologists are uneasy with because it, it shows a depth of understanding and, and uh, beauty in their culture that really shouldn't have existed with such ancient hominids. The archaeologists kept digging a bit more, as they tend to do, and they found that when they got to a layer that's about 380,000 years, they found tools there, they found a needle, they found certain artifacts that looked like bracelets and other ornaments, and they also found the ring, which has been beautifully shaped out of rock. It has been obviously machined and polished. Beautiful bone needles have been found in the Denisova cave, suggesting that the Denisovans wore tailored clothing. Horse DNA has also been found inside the cave itself, suggesting that the Denisovans not only uh, hunted horses, but probably domesticated them and may even have ridden horses. And this is probably tens of thousands of years before it was even thought possible that you could ride horses, something that was considered conventionally to only have occurred in Bronze Age times. And yet here we have people 40 to 50,000 years ago who were riding horses, domesticating them, catching them. The Siberian fossil remains found in Altai have challenged scientists to re-examine the transformation of human DNA. There's been an explosion of new information uh, in this field partly thanks to new genetic sequencing techniques and, and deep analysis of DNA. And it's clear that the story of the evolution of 
anatomically modern humans is much more complicated. The DNA breakthrough is we now know that our anatomically modern human ancestors interbred with Neanderthals. So we're a mixture of Neanderthals and the creature that became anatomically modern humans. And then adding further complication to the picture, Denisovan DNA is also found in the anatomically modern human genome. Trace elements in some areas, quite large amounts in others, the Denisovans pass to us various genes which have been important in our own development. For instance, in the Tibetan Plateau, the Sherpas and the indigenous peoples there, their ability to be able to spend long periods in extremely high altitudes comes from a gene which was inherited, we now know, from the Denisovans. There were other genes as well to do with our appearance, our intellect, our consciousness were also first developed through this idea of this hybridization. There are many modern populations around the world that have high levels of Denisovan DNA within their genes. We're talking about India, Southeast Asia, Java, Australia, Melanesia, Micronesia, various Native American peoples in Canada, in Mexico, also in the, the northern part of, of South America, have all got Denisovan DNA. These are all the descendants of the Denisovans. If Denisovans roamed the Earth for thousands of years, crossbreeding with other sapiens, it could explain how traces of their DNA have been found thousands of miles from Siberia in North America. It is almost certain that the Denisovans and their hybrid descendants ended up coming into the Americas. Indeed, it's now been found that in several different Native American um, peoples, Denisovan DNA exists. And this proves that they were the giants of legend and that they are responsible for the human skeletons, the oversized human skeletons that are found in mound complexes all over North America. I think we're just at the beginning of the process of unraveling the mystery of what uh, all of this means. It's almost heretical to say so uh, in context of modern anthropology, but I think we're going to have to revisit the out of Africa model. It may be that the evolution that led to anatomically modern humans uh, didn't take place entirely in Africa. We're looking at actually a very complicated picture that ultimately results in us. No Denisovans live today. No Neanderthals live today. We are the sole survivors of that intermingling of slightly different and sometimes very different looking but genetically close human species. How will this discovery shape our future? What other discoveries will come out within the next few years that will push our understanding of humanity? When we go back in time and we look at the evolution of species on Earth, we have all these different time periods that we can examine, but it's very difficult for us as a species to see the whole picture. It's like a bunch of puzzle pieces that we're still trying to put together. And as the puzzle comes together, we start to solve more and more about our origins and where we come from. And, and we're constantly in this evolutionary process trying to put something in front of ourselves that makes sense. But it's so multidimensional, it's hard to see. Perhaps archaeologists and scientists have just scratched the surface in the lineage of human DNA and where it might be going. It might be, not be so obvious to us because we live on a very day-to-day -day basis in a very short period of time. But I do believe that we adapt as a species and I think that that adaptation is happening right as we speak right now. We have climate change that's upon us. How are humans going to look 50, 100, 1,000 years from now? I bet they will look much different. I think it's all relative.
But there was a time when the Neanderthals were relative to the Earth. There was a time when 15-foot people were relative to the Earth. And the time for Homo sapiens also came along. Mainstream archaeology will not go any further than the layer of about 1,000 BC, because you might just find something that will completely upend the entire notion of where we come from and who we really are and how old we really are. I think it's a much more complicated story than we've imagined. And I must say the advances in DNA and in genetic work are incredibly important in, in solving this, this problem. We're now having to consider the possibility that there were multiple human-like species that, that existed on the planet. We're the only ones that are left, as far as we know. Our evolutionary process within our minds is what now needs to catch up. This is why we're trying to put all the pieces of the puzzle back together so that we can understand what our origins are and really where we need to go. We're not there yet, but we're close. If we are just beginning to understand our origins on this planet, what will we discover next? And how will that change the course of humanity? Does our evolution depend on the consciousness of this planet? Will the past unlock our hidden code of potentiality? And will we be able to survive as a species here on Earth and throughout the stars? If we look all around us, we see patterns. Patterns in nature, reflected on ancient monuments, codes in ancient languages, stories depicted about our past and who might have influenced it. Who are we? And where did we come from? These are the primordial questions we tried to answer in this series. But the answer is still out there, carved in stone, buried below the surface, and right before our eyes. We hope you enjoyed this insightful presentation from Gaia. After School subscribers can join Gaia and watch two complete seasons of Ancient Civilizations absolutely free. Just click the link in the description. But act fast, this offer is only available for a limited time.